Amen? Amen. So I'm going uh, to the message, and I like to start by reading a, a, a scripture in Jeremiah, chapter 2 and verse, verse 13. My message today is on the book of Jeremiah. And uh, uh, I titled my message, Bring Them Out of the Pit. Bring Them Out of the Pit. This is my message. And I hope you'll uh, uh, get something from what I'm, going, I'm about to share with you. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, I'm going to start here, and then we're going to uh, go a little bit further uh, on this book. But I, I like to start here because it's where uh, the danger situation started. There was, there was a huge danger that happened in the life of Jeremiah. He was about to die. But let's start here years before. So this is the, be the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, and he's prophesying. So he's speaking the word of God. And uh, God spoke to the, to the prophet, and the prophet brought the word into uh, the people, people of Israel. And here on verse 13, Jeremiah 2.13, uh, he said, For my people have committed double evil, or two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So... This story starts here, and this is the word of the Lord, and concerns something that, you know, they knew about, about water. Now, today, if we want water, we, we just open the, the, the faucet, and it's easy to have water. So we never think how the water uh, gets through the pipes into our house or whatever we are. So we, we, we're just blessed. But in those days, they didn't have a system of uh, retaining waters. So there, was, there were three main sources of water. One was uh, streams of water, what is called living water. That is the best water. It's always fresh. It comes uh, downstream and it's nice water. They had a second way of getting water, which was the well. Just a, a spring, an underground spring, and they, they would dig the, the well into the, the source of water. And that, that was number two way of getting water. And number three, which was, you know, the emergency way of, of getting water was a cistern. A cistern is an artificial well, and they will uh, 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 dig the, the, the cistern on ground in order to hold uh, all kinds of water. Uh, cisterns are very hard to build. If you ever went to Europe to one of the old castles, you will see on top of the mountain they had to have cisterns because obviously usually there's no fountains. So they, they will build cisterns, and in Israel they will build cisterns uh, in, in rocky ground. And so it was a hard work in order to uh, just dig those wells in, 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 in the rock and then making sure there were no cracks. But because this was so hard, they had a low, lower quality of cisterns. Cisterns that were well built and they will crack and they could not retain water. So, so the, the, they had to have a huge amount of rain in order to replenish the cisterns. But uh, 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 usually with time they will just crack and they will be used for different things. For sewage, for many other things. In fact, uh, as I was uh, reading this uh, scripture, and I, I like always to, to read the original words. And uh, in, in fact the word that we have here, water, uh, uh, in, the, in the original language, it's, uh, it's not just water, but it's literally piss. Okay, so, so the cisterns were used for, you know, all sorts of sewage. So uh, here's the word of the Lord, and the Lord is just rebuking his people because of two evils. It's a double sin, double evil. Number one, they have forsaken him. And then he says, I am the source or the fountain of living waters. So they've forsaken me for something which is inferior. And it's not number two, it's even number three. It's the cistern. And not only it's a, it's a cistern, but it's a broken cistern that cannot hold waters. And this was just an illustration of what God's people was, was doing in those days. And I believe this is also one of the scenes of the church today in our days is that many people that call themselves Christian, they forsake the name of the Lord and they go for something inferior. That's right. and, and it's not just something inferior uh, a well, but they go even to the lowest of the lowest. They dug cisterns and they cannot hold the water. You, you know, Jesus said, I am uh, uh, the source of living water. If you drink from me, 
you will never be thirsty. Amen. You remember when the, in, the, in the book of John, Jesus said that to, to that woman by the well? He, he said she was not on a system. She wasn't on a well. Number two. And the Lord is saying, if you drink from me, you'll have number one, the source of living waters. In fact, you'll have a fountain in you. It will be greatly beneficial to you because you'll be connected to me. Now, um, years later, and I want to get you to, uh, right to the message, and we go to Jeremiah 38, and my message is on Jeremiah 38. There was a, a, a season of great distress in Israel. And they were being attacked by enemies. Uh, there were being uh, uh, a lot of evil things were happening to, to them. And some of them realized that Jeremiah the prophet had spoken all these evil things years before. Mm -hmm. And they were really upset with uh, Jeremiah. Uh, because he was pointing out the evil things that they were doing. Now, nobody likes to be criticized. Mm -hmm. That's right. And some people will even find all kinds of excuses. Because when we, when we use the Bible, it's very easy for people to get offended. You know, people get offended when the Bible says that God doesn't approve certain behaviors or certain social things that we do in our days that are considered normal. And, uh, and so people try to kind of whitewash the Bible and, uh, you know, try to uh, not to mention certain parts of the Bible because we don't want to offend people. People will get easily offended. They got so offended with Jesus. In fact, you know what they did? They crucified him. That's right. And it all started not with just ordinary people, even religious people. Whenever the Word of God is spoken, we need to have our hearts open. And, and we need to have this attitude I'm receiving now from the source of living waters. You know, if I, if I just have a devotional time myself, if I don't come to church, uh, I'm, I'm digging a cistern for myself. And it can hold or it can be cracked. I, I, I don't even know. But it's very important that I receive a fresh word of God. Right. You're so blessed here in this church mm -hmm. because you have so many different uh, ministers from, uh, from rabbis to Baptists to Pentecostal to, and, and you received it. This shows me that there's n not a great prejudice in terms of uh, doctrinal issues. It's, it's very good to have a sound doctrine, but above sound doctrine, we need to re receive a fresh word. Yes, right. And I can receive a fresh word from a rabbi, I can receive a fresh word from a nun, as long as it's a, a man or a woman of God that has a connection with the source of living waters, I receive it. That's right, that's right. I don't have a prejudice, but they did. And they were so, so upset with him that they decided to do something to this prophet. Listen, this was a man of God. This was a good man. And uh, Jeremiah 38, it says on verse 6, that they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon or sister, cistern pit in charge of uh, Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard. And they let Jeremiah down into the pit with ropes. And in the dungeon or cistern pit, there was no water, but only mire. And Jeremiah sank in the mud, in the mire. So here's a good man. And the first thing I want to tell you is that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. I don't know if you're good people. I, I, I guess you are. <laughs> I hope you are. <laughs> you look like good people. Uh, you look like someone that could be friends with Jeremiah. And here's Jeremiah, the man of God, the prophet. They had no pastors at the time, they had, but they had these leaders. And Jeremiah was a, a traveling evangelist. He was a, a mighty man of God. And he will not wash down the, the word of the Lord. So he will point and he will say, you're doing evil things. You need to repent. And because they didn't repent, their situation uh, worsened. So they, they, were, they were not just being attacked by the enemy, but they had famine, they had drought, they had all sorts of things. And, and it was so dry that there was even no water in the cistern that was at the sun at the palace, it was the the, uh, the sons uh, the son of, of the king. Uh, they had that cistern there, and there was no water. There was just mire, and it was a really deep cistern because they, they didn't just throw Jeremiah there. Uh, I mean, if it was the height of this building, they could just push him because there was uh, mud. 
but it was probably a lot deeper. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe a hundred feet. I don't know how deep uh, that cistern was, but it was quite something. It was a work uh, of, of many years and it was right there. Uh, the, the Bible says in this verse, it was on the court of the guard. So soldiers would have to use it and they couldn't because it was, we know it, it was broken and it was um, um, uh, it happened what many times they did in the in the in the uh, old cultures. They transformed the pit into a prison because there was no way of escape. It was the worst kind of jail that someone could have. In fact, they were putting Jeremiah there to die. They want him to die slowly. And can you imagine? Uh, he was descended uh, by ropes. It said. It says that they had ropes and they just uh, let him go. And can you imagine the prophet? He had the ropes maybe around his arms, his armpits, and uh, and they were lowering him and lowering him. And it was getting darker and darker and darker. It, it was a pit, and as he was getting down to the end of the pit, I can imagine that probably there was there was mosquitoes. There was uh, I don't know all kinds of bugs, uh, maybe spiders. I, I, I just can't imagine what, what was going there. Cockroaches, uh, rats, <laughs> you know, the rats love those places. Uh, so, so he was being lowered and then he hit the bottom and he started to sink. And in, in fact, according to, to history of those days, those cisterns usually hold mire or, 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 or this kind of clay, mud, that will go up to the neck of the people being imprisoned there, either to the waist or to the neck. So it was a situation of being just uh, 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 put in a place of torture, lit literal torture. And he was a righteous man. Uh, and you know the Bible says in Psalm 34, 19, that a righteous man may, may have many troubles. But the Lord delivers them from, from all. Yes. So Jeremiah was being put in that situation, but he had a hope. Right. Do you have a hope? Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been there in the pit. The pit of life. Situations that we're not expecting. Situations that as Christians we think we're far away from that because... We, I mean, we're Christians, we live in victory. And we hear the message of faith and we have this faith in the Lord. But then suddenly there is uh, things that happen in our lives that, are, that, that somehow are similar to this situation of Jeremiah. It's like we're being lowered into the bottom of, of something. It's like there's no, no, no way out. And uh, I, I read a story once, uh, I think it's a true story, of a former... Uh, world chess champion uh, that was taken by a friend to see this picture in an art gallery and uh, the picture uh, was entitled Checkmate and, uh, and on the picture there was a, a little boy playing chess and the opponent was the devil and the devil was uh, doing checkmate to the kid and uh, the, the artist portrayed this with a malicious intent and the, the, the chess champion just sat down and he was looking, gazing at the painting where the devil was doing checkmate to this uh, little boy. And, uh, and he was getting upset with that. And, and finally he said, quick, bring me a chessboard. And, and so he, he went to the car, uh, his friend brought a chessboard and he put all the, all, all the, all the, 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 the chess pieces into place and look into it for about an hour. And then he said, enough. <laughs> this is not a checkmate. I can win this game. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know what? A chess champion may have a way out of difficult situations on the board. I'm not a great chess player, but I, I enjoy playing chess. And uh, I, I remember that I, I, I like to play, play chess with my sister because I could win easily. <laughs> but whenever I had to play with somebody else, and sometimes really good chess players, I will get discouraged and I say, why, why should I bother playing with you? I will, I'll always lose. <laughs> and, and sometimes we can have this kind of attitude 
to life. And life is not a game. Some people will face life as a game. Life is wonderful. Life is so special. God gave you a life, but sometimes it seems that you are in a situation, a checkmate. It's like there's no way out. Like these people we prayed for, they are with a situation of cancer. And, and cancer years ago was synonymous of death. Today, there's some treatments, but hey, if the doctor tells you you have cancer, you're pretty much doomed uh, to, uh, either to a, a terrible treatment or to death. That's right. And so it's a situation of checkmate. And it seems that it's over. But let me tell you, when you have Jesus Christ in your life, it's not over. When God is in control of your life, it's not over. You know, when Jeremiah was going down to the pit, he knew it's not over. I think he was singing that song, saying, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver me from them all. You know, I mean, I love singing these hymns from the hymn book. But uh, the book of Psalms is even better. <laughs> I wish we had the, the, you know, the music for those uh, wonderful Psalms. But in this, in this situation, uh, Jeremiah was uh, through, thrown into the pit, uh, you know, just to die. And usually in those days they, they will cover the pit because those pits were, were covered. And he was there in complete darkness, in the mud, excruciating heat. A little bit fresher because he was down into the pit. But that mud was probably up to his head. All those bugs, everything dark. It's a pit. There's a reason why we call it a pit. And we associate pit with doom and with condemnation and with destruction. He was in jail for doing nothing, for preaching the word of the Lord. And he was going through that situation. And many other people. I think they will have, uh, start to curse others, to curse even God, and to deny uh, whatever they believe and say, God, where am, I, where am I here? What did I do? But Jeremiah understood that his life was meant to be a reading book to others, right. like an example to others. And as Christians, we need to understand this. When a bad situation happens, don't fall into despair. God is always with you. And He is able to bring you out of the pit. Amen. But He could not come out of the pit alone. God prepared a plan. And there were people that were sensitive. And today, I would like to ask you. Do you know people in the pit? Do you know people around you that are in the pit because of sin? Because Jeremiah wasn't because of sin. But many people fall into the pit because of sin. I've been there. There's no way out. People that have gambling debts, they don't know what to do. People that, that are so broke that they, they think it's impossible to get out of their, situ their right. situation and they kill themselves. That's right. People that are you know, hooked into heroin and co cocaine and crack and all these drugs now even these synthetic drugs that make people act like, like zombies, all these things that happen in the world. And people are hooked into these things and they're th right there at the bottom of the pit. Do you know people like this? Doesn't matter the age, sometimes they're, they're young kids. We see them all, the, all around. You know, I was driving here on the highway. I saw two kids covered with tattoos and, and a, 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 a young man and a young girl and they were, you know, those uh, uh, weird haircuts and tattoos and walking on the highway. And I, I was looking at, at them. I couldn't stop. And I, uh, and I just uh, uh, watched through the rear mirror, you know, the situation. And I thought, these kids are in the pit. And I pray God bless them. Yes. Bring them out of the pit. Use someone. Use me. And here's a man in Jeremiah uh, 38, 7. His name was Abed Melech. And it says on verse 7, Now when Abed Melech, the Ethiopian, a Cushite, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon or cistern pit. And while the king was then sitting in the gate of Benjamin, Abed Melech went out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord, the king, these men have done evil in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, 
whom they have cast into the deep dungeon cistern pit, and he is liable to die of hunger, and he is as good as dead in the place where he is, for there is no more bread left in the city. So here's a man, he's a black man. He's from the tribe of Cush, so he's an Ethiopian. And this black man is a, a eunuch, so it's a man who had been castrated in order to uh, take care of, of um, uh, as bodyguard uh, to, to the many women that kings used to have in the palaces. So th these were very strong black men. Have you ever seen a very strong black man? Did you? I have some friends that are black men, really strong. I mean, when they work out, you don't want to mess with, with them. So he was a very strong man. He was a bodyguard. And eunuchs usually gain extra weight. So he, he was probably, you know, a big, massive man. And he was there passing by, but he had compassion for someone that he knew was in the pit. He had compassion enough to put his life at risk because the men who decided to put Jeremiah there were very powerful. Powerful enough to use the, the, the guards' um, facilities to put Jeremiah into the dungeon. So these were men of high position. They hated the, the word of the Lord. They, they hated God. They hated the things of God. Because there were, there were people that enjoyed living in sin. And when people enjoy living in sin and they have positions of authority, they do terrible things to Christians and to, to people that walk with God. It's, you know, history repeats itself. It's the same thing today. And, Jer and uh, this man, a bad Malik, and the bad uh, Malik means uh, servant of the king, that's the meaning of his name. He, this African man, they, he, uh, he didn't just do what, what other people were doing. They were saying, who cares? There's hunger. There's no bread in the city. There's no food. So who cares if this old man uh, is dying there in the pit? Who cares if the prophet is there? You know, think about yourself. Why, why are you wasting time Think about others? But God is looking for people that are compassionate, that feel bothered, when they see people at the bottom of the pit. Right. And as Christians, many times we are failing to, to win souls to Christ because we look the other way when we see people at the bottom of the pit. We need to make an effort mm -hmm. to bring them out. And many times these people at the bottom of the pit, they, they look like they're tough because they have their tattoos and piercings and they look like or they have their leather jackets or whatever they use in order to look like they're really tough. But you know what? It's not the outside that makes you tough. That's right. Jeremiah was a tough man. Mm -hmm. Here he, he is at the bottom of the pit. Probably praising and having a great time with the Lord. That's right. Because when you have a relationship with God... Man, when you're in jail, when you're in a situation, in isolation, there's nothing else to do. There was no Nintendo, there was no TV, there, there was no uh, iPads or iPods or whatever. Here is Jeremiah at the bottom of the pit. Maybe thinking, I'm about to die. Maybe happy, saying, finally, I'm going to meet you, Lord, face to face. But... I guess he was praying and praising, and I don't know if he had a good voice, but he was probably singing hymns, the hymns they sang at the time. And at the same time, God was moving this man to a situation of risk, and he decided to act and talk to the king. Do you talk to our king, to the real king, about others? Are you compassionate when you see them suffering? Or you just say, ah, what a, what, a, what a life. Oh, look at that prostitute. Uh, let's go to the other side of the street. I don't want to even get near to, to that person. Oh, look, here he comes, my neighbor, drunk again. Are you compassionate enough to bring that person out of the pit? Or you just look the other side. Let me finish this message. On verse 10, it says that the king then commanded Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian, saying, 
take from here 30 men with you and raise Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon, sister or pit before he dies. So the king was able to listen to Abed Malik and he considered what he was saying. Maybe he thought, well, he's as good as that. There's no food in the city. He might as well, you know, die around here because this is bad for my political political career. I will look bad if the prophet dies there. Things are terrible enough as they are. So he told Abed Malik, remember, he's a strong man. He's a bodyguard. He's a strong black Ethiopian bodyguard. But he said, take 30 men with you. Now, why do you need 31 people to bring one man out of the pit? That's a lot of work. I mean, 30, 30 men, it's a lot of people. And Abed Melech was probably 100 feet low, but they needed the strength to pull them out of the mud. And it, it was, it required some skills. To do this work. On verse 11 said he took the man. And I'd like you to read this verse. It says he went into the house of the king. To a room under the treasury. And took along from there old rags. And worn out garments. And let them down by ropes. Into the dungeon cistern pit. To Jeremiah. So here's Abed Malik. It requires a certain technique. To bring someone out of a pit. It's, it's not just a matter of saying, here's the rope. Come on. You know, it's like some, some people, uh, some Christians think, well, uh, if, I, if I'm going to help that person in trouble, let me bring a, a flyer from the church. Here is, here is, God loves you. God loves you. And, oh Lord, bless that flyer so that he will be saved. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Or you just come to church and say, Oh Lord, save our community. It's not going to work. You need skills. Mm -hmm. You need a team of people. If they needed a team of 31 men to save a prophet from the bottom of a pit, he must have been, he, he was so skinny. I mean, there's hunger in the place. He's an old man. He's a prophet. You know, I've read the diets of some prophets in the Old Testament. Like John the Baptist, he, he used to, to eat grasshoppers and honey. I don't know if you get fat with grasshoppers and honey, but I, I don't think so. I think, he, I think he was a skinny man at the bottom of the pit. We don't need 31 men to bring a, 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 an old man from the bottom of the pit. But the king knew this is going to be hard, hard work because he probably need some protection from the people that have put him there. You know, I remember when I started working uh, uh, for the Lord, my first job was a teen challenge, and I was in a really tough neighborhood evangelizing prostitutes and uh, gang leaders, and it was a really tough job. We will never go to, on those streets alone. <laughs> never. We were always in teams of 10, 12 people, because we knew that sometimes we could have trouble. And, and once we, we were in a, in a room about the size of this church and uh, we, were, we were finishing a, a small service we had there and six gang leaders just locked the doors and they pulled down their weapons, uh, uh, short gun, shotguns uh, with, uh, with um, uh, you, you know, uh, all the weaponry they use on the streets and they pointed at us to threaten us. It was scary. I mean, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> it was really scary. But we prayed that we were bold, and they left us. And we told them, listen, one day you're going to need us. And as I, I told this to that man, one year later, he entered into a rehab program. Amen. One of those guys the Lord. seemed to be the leader of that group. And you know, sometimes we can be even attacked by others. We can be mocked. People can tease uh, you for what you believe. But there is a certain technique in order to bring people out of the pit. I like to see all of you bringing others out of the pit. Amen. And God can use anything. He used old rags. It says here that, that uh, he went under the treasury to get old rags and some old garments. Why? Because if he pulled Jeremiah just with ropes, he was going to be injured. And sometimes 
when we try to bring people out of their life of sin, out of the pit, there's injuries. And we, we don't want to hurt those people even more. And sometimes Christians hurt others because they keep nagging them. And they keep saying, you know, God is upset with you. And all that, that has happened, it's a curse on you. And all these things. Listen, when we bring people out of the pit, we need to use compassion. That's right. And if God can use an old rag, He can use me. That's right. If God can use, uh, you know, we can have, can have all sorts of excuses. Maybe you feel that sometimes you're useless. God cannot use you. But if, if uh, an old rag was good enough to bring the prophet out of the pit, it can happen with you. Finally, this is the end of the story. Now this is the good part. On verse 12, it says that Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, pulled Jeremiah and, and he said, put these old rags and worn out garments under your armpits, under the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And verse 13 says, so they drew up Jeremiah with ropes and took him out of the dungeon or cistern pit and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. So, so uh, after he was rescued, they wanted to make sure that he was well kept. So he remained in the court of the guard. It wasn't just, it was, uh, it wasn't just the work of pulling the, him out, but to keep him alive. <coughs> and you see, when we have compassion uh, uh, and we want to bring others out of the pit, and maybe now you can think about your neighbors, maybe some people in your family, your kids, I don't know uh, uh, what's happening with, with you in your, in your life. Maybe it's uh, a person that you see every day on your way to work and you know that person is at the bottom of the pit. Maybe you are at the bottom of, of the pit. It requires teamwork and after the rescue uh, there was a, a process of protection and consolidation. In conclusion, let me ask you, are, are you one of these people that God is looking for like Abed Malik, the servant of the king? Are you like this man that had compassion to put his life at risk to rescue another, another man's life? Maybe you are one of those at the bottom of the pit and crying out for help. And if, if so, let me tell you, you're not here by accident. Right. There's more than 30 people here. We're more than able to bring you out of the pit. That's right. We're more than able you know, to use whatever means in order to pull you out of that situation. Certain times we ignore the warnings. We ignore the Word of God. And we just say, well, uh, you know, the world, everybody uh, commits adultery. Why not me, you know? Uh, what is the problem in doing this, in committing this sin, or watching pornography, or doing this, or doing that? What's the problem? And, uh, and we look to the world around us, and we, we think there's no problem in anything. You know, we, we see things that are happening just uh, this month, that, like that, that crazy man that went into a movie theater and just blasted and uh, 70 people were injured with bullets. Mm -hmm. and, and people are asking, why? It's so obvious. Have you seen uh, movies lately? I'm not just talking about Batman, but have you seen movies lately? It's obvious why people are doing this kind of stuff. Right. It's because they feel themselves with this pollution and human life has no value. So it seems that everything is a joke. <clears throat> to me, it's obvious why these things happen and it's going to be worse and worse and worse. That's right. Why? Because this is the way the world lives. Now as Christians, sometimes we get to bottom of the pit situations. And... Um, uh, let me just conclude by reading two verses of Scripture and I'd like to pray for you. One, it's in the book of Psalms, Psalm 40, verse 2, that says, He lift, lifted me out of the sli slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Psalm 40, verse 2. Amen. What a good verse. I think Jeremiah knew this verse. Because it was written years before by King David. So probably he knew Psalm 40, verse 2. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. I wonder if he was singing this song. That's a good song to sing if, when you're in the pit. <laughs> right? And he said, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Can you imagine a situation in which you're just uh, you, with your head above the mud? 
Have you ever felt in a situation like this? I mean, your debts are so high that you don't know what to do. Or, you know, you're, you, you, have a, a, you, were, you were diagnosed with a, a disease and they told you have two or three months to live. Have you ever been there? <laughs> it's terrible. I've been there more than once with doctors telling me you're, you're going to die. And I'm so grateful that I'm still here. And I know it's not because of any special treatment. It's the grace of God. I trust in the Lord. And it's in those moments when you're at the, at the bottom of the pit that you need to know your Bible. That you need to quote your scripture. That you need to say, He set my feet upon the rock. Maybe if your feet are not, not there yet, but you start praising the Lord, calling the things that are not as if they were. And my last scripture, it's in the book of Job. Job 33, verse 28. And Job is, is the oldest book of the Bible. So I guess Jeremiah knew this scripture too. Job 32, 33, 28. He redeemed my soul from going down to the pit and I will live to enjoy the light. Now, the church is here and the church is the rope of this world. There are more than 30 people in this church. Can, can the church go out there and rescue some people out of the pit? Yes. I guess so. And I know you want to do so. And sometimes you, you have the desire, but there's not an order from the king. So it's time for us to get on our knees. And when we see someone in the pit, we don't rest until the king says, go there and do this. That's right. Go there and do that. Go there and rest with that person. And I, I have this assurance that the Lord wants everyone to be saved. Try.